Susie Penguin, yikes, I have a clotting autoimmune condition. Well, interestingly enough, I'm gonna go ahead and give you the punchline, that clotting discussion. One of the things that's coming up and several people are considering, you know, by the time we know that somebody's got getting COVID-19 from coronavirus infection, maybe we should go ahead and start covering them with uh, blood thinners, anti-clot mechanism. Well, guess what? I'm already on it. Why am I on it? I'm on Eliquis. You know, you see Eliquis, Xarelto, you see some of those medicines. Here's why so many people are on it. The number one cause or the number one cardiac dysrhythmia or arrhythmia is what people used to call it, but that arrhythmia means no rhythm. You got to have rhythm or you won't be alive. Dysrhythmia means not such a good rhythm. Number one dysrhythmia is what? I've got it, atrial fib. And here's one of the things. We used to think that cryptic or stroke of unknown origin. Well, then we're beginning to find all those strokes of unknown origin, and by far the majority of strokes were used to be, quote, unknown origin, we're finding out are due to atrial fib. Atrial fib like I've got, which is called paroxysmal atrial fib, which fibrillation, which means your heart's beating at a normal pace on a regular basis, but then it'll go into atrial fibrillation on an, you know, it may go into 15 second run of atrial fib. Well, these unnoticed runs of atrial fib appear to be enough to cause clots. So if you have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, A, you probably don't know it. Just like that 90% of people that have prediabetes don't know it. And if you have it, if you have atrial fib, your probability of having a stroke has just gotten multiplied by five to seven times. And again, you don't know it. Now, most people that have atrial fib, at least most baby boomers, once you get to that age, probably need to be on one of these anti-clotting mechanisms. So like they're called uh, NOAX, new or novel oral anticoagulants, again, the most common ones are Rivaroxaban or Xarelto and Eliquis, like I'm on. So again, maybe I'm jumping around a little bit, but it's an important concept. Again, another hugely neglected area in terms of health of baby boomers. Dave Murphy, what are your thoughts on low-dose aspirin? You know, there was the Aspree trial, A-S-P-R-E-E, -E, and a couple of others about 12 to 18 months ago. And the interpretation that came out of the Esprit trials was a low dose aspirin is not indicated anymore. It didn't really help. Well, that was wrong in my book. I don't agree with it. And I think it's related to the fact that doctors, for the most part today, tend to practice prevention from you know, it's a cardiologist who's primarily a cardiologist and remembers a few things about prevention and just tries to apply that or a family practitioner or whatever. I know I'm being a preventive medicine snob, but here's the thing. I think we do a lot of people a lot of disservice not knowing and thinking through the details. I appreciate you bringing this up, David. So what you saw with the Esprit trial was this. There was a lower amount of benefit and obviously the same amount of risk. You know, there's nothing that's risk-free, especially aspirin. If I were in the FDA, I'd rather them go back and make metformin non-prescription and especially the Freestyle Libre non-prescription, but then turn around and make aspirin prescription because aspirin has some risks. Now, what they showed in the Esprit trial is that the benefits for people taking baby aspirin were not as high anymore. And that was because we've made progress. You know, despite the fact that heart attack and stroke are still the major causes of death and disability, even in the age of COVID, by the way, that's what the early numbers prior to the show mean. Even with that, we've made progress. We're better than we were 10 years ago and 20 years ago when the original baby aspirin studies were done. 
So therefore, the interpretation was, hmm, we don't think you need to take baby aspirin anymore. Well, here's the problem. And here's where we weren't thinking. The standards committees, I think, were not thinking. I know they're thinking, but I don't agree with them. The standards committees, before they were saying, if you turn age, what, 55, 60, you should start taking baby aspirin. Well, I understand why they said that. I mean, that's when you start getting into the risk age for heart attack and stroke. But what about the people that have no plaque? If you have no plaque, why would you be taking baby aspirin? Where else do we see that question? We make the same kind of assumption. If you have a, an LDL level over 120 or over 100, and some people are even saying over 70, then you need to be taking a statin. If you've got no plaque, you don't need to be taking a statin and you don't need to be taking a baby aspirin. So if you go back and you rewrite those standards and say, look, unless you have plaque, you don't take statin or baby aspirin, then all of a sudden the vast majority of the statin prescriptions would go away and the vast majority of the aspirin prescriptions would go away. The people that are left are the people that have known plaque. If you've got known plaque, your risk for heart attack and stroke is much higher than somebody that doesn't. At that point, I do think you need to be taking baby aspirin. But the bottom line is this. For people that have plaque, I think you need to be on a blood thinner, either low dose baby aspirin, 81 milligrams daily. You also, by the way, are in that risk category at that point. If you have plaque, you're also in the risk category to have the other chronic diseases like high blood pressure and, by the way, unrecognized paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So I think you need to rule that out. If you have atrial fibrillation, aspirin doesn't work as well. You need at that point to be on one of the NOACs, novel oral anticoagulants like Eliquis or Zarelto. continue to get great feedback regarding the webinars and here's why you know on the internet when you hear a webinar you expect for somebody to try to sell you something we're not doing that we're trying to tell you something people are coming in with their labs from quest inflammation panel OGTT insulin survey response and then they're finding out do I have inflammation do I have insulin resistance and where does that fit in terms of other folks we're getting ready to start one for CIMT as well. So again, people are really excited about finding out their own status. Looking forward to seeing you there. Thanks.